life is good and people are good, even when very sad things happen. Once you eliminate the root fear in life, which is the fear of death, then all other fears disappear. Welcome everybody to the Jeff Mara podcast. If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes or Spotify or something else, I just want to let you know that this podcast is also on YouTube, so you can go to Jeff Mara Podcast on YouTube and check it out. Today's guest is Stephen Weber. Stephen was in an accident and he ended up being in a coma and had a near-death experience. He has since written a book of his experience called The Place Between Here and There, and today we get to talk to him about his book, his experience, and perhaps some of his insights from his experience. Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate your time and I appreciate you joining me. Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and your audience. Thank you. If you don't mind, can we just start um, right on the day of your accident and move forward from there? Very well. I'll, uh, I'll explain uh, <laughs> everything from, uh, from the very start. Mm-hmm. Is that, uh, is that um, you know, it's basically a day like any other day. Mm-hmm. I was uh, driving out to Eastern Long Island. That's where we live to go to a barbecue place with my then wife. Um, We were at the end of our relationship. Our children were in high school preparing to uh, go to college. And we were just trying to keep our relationship together. We we had gone, you know, as people do, we just drifted apart over the years and uh, and our children were our focus. And mm-hmm. so uh, so that's what we would do is we'd go for a ride on my Harley Davidson and uh, go out east and have some burgers or some uh, wings and something and just have a pleasant afternoon uh, out. Mm-hmm. And so we had gone to this barbecue place and on the way out, the traffic was backed up for miles. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I waited in traffic for a little while, but then people started to go off on the side of the road and make a right at an intersection above, uh, you know, a few, uh, I don't know, about a half mile down the road. So after a while of sitting there, I finally decided to do the same thing. And just when I was coming up to the intersection, a car made a left-hand turn, a truck, and slammed right into the side of my motorcycle throwing my my wife off the back and I absorbed the full impact of the um, of the truck wow. and uh, the next thing I knew I was on my back and I was looking around it was obvious some time had passed mm-hmm. because there were there were emergency workers all around me and uh, and I wasn't sure what was going on and uh, but but as I tried to move and stuff I realized, I was seriously injured, and this day was going to be like no other day in my life. There was no way of going back. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I realized is I was floating up towards the clouds, and I was getting higher and higher, and I knew something terrible had had happened. And Mm -hmm. in my own mind, I was giving up to perhaps this, I was dying. Uh, uh, If you don't mind me, I I hate to interrupt, but so... When you were floating up to the clouds, did you look down and see your body and all the all the action there? Yes, uh, I did. I saw said, everything. Hey, and you you looked and did you realize that's me still down there, or you just said, "Hmm, I wonder what's going." You know, well, I didn't re- see myself. You didn't see didn't yourself. See Interesting. No, I didn't see myself at all. And um, and uh, but I saw the accident scene. And I saw the pieces of motorcycle all over and the cars were lined up for miles. Wow. And I just kept on rising up and up. And just as I was about to go through the clouds, I started to come back down. Hmm. And I got closer and I closer. And then I realized I was actually in a helicopter and I was landing at Stony Brook Hospital, one of the best trauma centers in the United States. And it's a university hospital. They just, they're miracle workers there. And, uh, and I was on the tarmac and they came and got me. And that's the last time I remember being on this earth for what seemed like an eternity, but it was, uh, it was about three weeks that I was in the coma. I had catastrophic injuries. My spine was broken, and uh, and they had to insert two steel rods in my spine to stabilize it. Mm-hmm. I had a traumatic brain injury. I had um, I had a shattered hip. My hip was all in pieces, and they had to pin that back together. Broken arm, broken leg, ribs. But the most serious is I had internal injuries and I was bleeding inside. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they had to do several operations to stabilize me. Finally, they got me stabilized. 
And then, uh, and then the next thing is that my foot started to swell and it was cutting off the blood. And so I had to do just um, miraculous surgeries. Mm. And then I was in my hospital bed. And, uh, but in my mind, I was in a different place, a place that I call between here and there. And, uh, and it isn't where you go when you die and it isn't here. It's kind of like an in-between place. Mm -hmm. And I have to stress is that I was zero on the spirituality scale prior to this. Mm -hmm. I was a beer drinking, hot winging, eating mm -hmm. motorcycle guy. You know, I was a computer guy, but, but I lived a life. I've traveled all over the United States and, uh, and spirituality just wasn't my thing. I loved motorcycles and I loved Harley Davidson's. I loved partying and I, you know, I often say being a spiritualist guy now, if the guy who I was 10 years ago met Stevie today, he beat the crap out of him. Wow. <laughs> you know, because it, it was such a change. Wow. Uh, but, uh, but, but so I'm in my hospital bed and in my mind, I'm in this other place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the first place, I, and it was a place where time didn't exist. And that's a very important concept. And what I mean by that is here time. What is time? Time is the ticking of the clock, the sun rising and falling, appointments in the future, you know, pots boiling on the stove. There's none of that there. Mm. What time is measured is by your experience, your spiritual growth. You don't, that's the only thing that, that changes is that how you see yourself and how you see the people around you. And I'll give you an example. Before yep. you do that, let me stop you there. I just want to clarify a few things. Yep. Um, so when you were going up in the air, you probably weren't out of your body yet. You were just in a helicopter flying to Stony Bridge. And then when you got there- Stony uh, Brook. Stony Brook. And when you got there, you were probably already unconscious, I'm assuming- and you were just out and already comatose, or did they have to? One, did they have to induce you into a coma, or you were already comatose? I was, yeah, I was dying. I was, I, I was out. I was dying. Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, I was in a very, very bad state. In mm -hmm. fact, in any other place on the planet, I would have been dead. Right. There, so there's, right. There, there's no doubt. Just the fact that they were able to land the helicopter in a schoolyard, mm -hmm. and it was just the flight of way that this trauma surgeon was on duty, everything had to happen. Right. And so your last probably conscious memory of being on the planet was just in the helicopter ride. Yes, it was. And then, and then your next memory or you, when you came, when after all this experience is over is when you came back and that's your next conscious member of being back here. Correct. Yes, but it's a little bit more complicated than that okay. because that when I was in the other place, I didn't know I was any place else because the first place mm -hmm. was deeply rooted in my experience here on earth. Okay. It, I didn't know anything happened, although I should have known. Mm -hmm. The first place was a work-like setting and there were many people there from, uh, from my life. But uh, mm -hmm. the first thing is I noticed is that some people I hadn't seen in years but they were just as I remember them. Some people I saw just yesterday and they were all in that environment. And, uh, and what I was doing is I was helping them with their computers. But mm. over time, as I realized is that it had nothing to do with computers. And that was teaching me more about the duality of life, how, how everything in life has its, its meaning, but there's always a deeper meaning behind things. And so like in this instance is that is that I began to see people that I knew as older people. I started to see them as young people. Hmm. And then I was beginning to recognize them. I might have saw a young person as an old person. And then I was beginning to recognize them still. And so then I started to see a man as a woman, wow. not as anything up else but a true bio woman. Mm -hmm. And they saw the same thing as a man, as a, a woman, as a man. And so I was seeing all these different, different people in different shapes and forms. And what I was being able to talk, uh, taught to see is the spirit, the spirit inside everybody, that part of you, which doesn't change. 
And, uh, and by seeing people that I knew in different forms, I was beginning to see what part of them is that part of you that goes on forever. You know, you have a different body. You have a, a, a you're not a boy. You're not a girl. You're not a, a father. You're not a son. You are a spirit. And that was the first thing as I learned in that space. I learned to recognize the spirit in everybody and everything. All right. So these people that you were seeing, were they dead or were they still living on earth? And two, were these experiences, are you doing a life review or were these new experiences with these people? All awesome questions. I'm glad you asked them. Okay. At this point, I saw nobody who was dead. Everybody was alive in my life, at least all that I knew. Some of these people I haven't seen in years, but 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 no, they were all alive people who were in my life. Mm-hmm. And I was being shown how to see the spirit in them. And, uh, and so I had a life review, but first I had to have my awareness raised. And mm-hmm. so the first thing as I was taught is to recognize spirit. And, uh, and then, uh, and then the next thing is that I began to, I began to see spirit in everything. Once I was able to feel the spirit in people, I began to feel the spirit in animals, in the stars, in the sky. Everything about us has a spirit. And it's just a core principle of life is that we are all connected in a real way. Mm -hmm. And so, and so first I was taught the spirit. And the next things I was taught is that everything has a spirit. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I was taught that we all, are like cells in a body. We all, ju- just like your cells in your body, make up you, and there's a consciousness of you. Mm. All of us make up a consciousness, and that's the consciousness of the creator. The creator and the creation are one. We are all part of the same universe. There is not two. The people, all of us, we all are part of the creator themselves. And that's who we are. And that's our destiny here on earth. Mm -hmm. Our destiny is to learn and to grow and to have through that awareness is to have spiritual evolution. And as we evolve as spirit, the whole universe, the whole world, everything we know evolves as well. The universe, the creator and the creation are one. Mm -hmm. So, so in this place, those are the first lessons I learned. I term this as being taught the language of the universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's kind of like a way of understanding. And once I learned this language of the universe, then I went through this life review. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And I'll, you know, initially it makes me wonder, you know, as some people talk about the multiverse theory and, you know, there's infinite universes and, you know, you and I may be best friends in another universe, you know, and in another universe, we may hate each other or whatever, you know, so I, I, this in between place kind of makes me think, okay, what, maybe he was in like a, you know, or maybe the in between in general is kind of like a different multiverse plane of existence. And, um, two, I'd like to know what you think about that. And two, besides interacting with people, did you, that you knew, did you interact with a godlike being and or angels? Okay. So, so the first question is, is that, no, I didn't feel it was like a multiverse. What I felt like it, I guess Catholics call it purgatory, but, but, but as Catholics learned about purgatory, purgatory was a place of punishment. Mm -hmm. No, I think what this place is getting you ready, it's getting ready for you to die and to pass and to go on to the next stage of your spiritual evolution. Mm -hmm. You know, many times people think about is is heaven or being reincarnated. It was to prepare you. And, uh, and I was on the verge of life and death for three, three, uh, three weeks. It was, it was touch and go. There were so many instances where, where I just eat through as a person, as, as a human being. And so, and so I was really on that edge of life and death. And so, uh, so in the way that things work is that I was being prepared to die. And so I was being taught the lessons that I was going to have to learn to be in spirit form, either be reincarnated to have another earthly experience or to go into spirit world. And, and we'll touch on that a little bit later, more in detail. 
detail, mm -hmm. but uh, but that what I was that's what I was being prepared for. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then your second question, what was that? Uh, while you were there, and I even I, gosh, I have so many questions. But first of all, while you were there, um, did you speak with? the okay. creator or a creator or any ang angelic beings or somebody giving you direction, you know, like, was there some mentor spiritual being giving you direction or were you kind of just all on your own learning these lessons on your own? Okay. So the short answer is yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that's, and that's later on. I, I, I need to explain a couple of things in order for that to make sense because you can, you can talk about these spiritual things and it'll sound like gobbledygook unless you, you, you put it into the right frame, framework. And really, because all this was new to me and I, I really had to be brought from one step to another. And so the first step in this place was to learn the spirituality, the language of the universe, how things are, are connected or that your teacher, as I was learning these things, the most important teacher is inside of you. Actually, you know, from your own experiences, that's the way you grow through your awareness. Mm -hmm. And so the next phase was through the life review where I relived my life. And so I would relive my life with my understanding of my new spirituality, my understanding, and plus living it for the second time. I had new insights into my experiences. And so then when I was done with my life review, I felt so much better. I felt like all of a sudden, a lot of things that happened to me in my life I wasn't upset about anymore. Mm -hmm. And the happy things were still happy, but I started to have no shame, no regret, no animosity towards anybody. Mm -hmm. I began to feel at peace because the things that I ha happened to me makes, made sense then. And then what happened is I went and had another rock life review and I'd go through the life review. And then at the end, I grew spiritually each time and I became more aware and I became more blissful. People often ask me, were there pretty colors and other things? Other people experienced that. I did not experience that. What I experienced was beautiful bliss based upon my awareness growing. And all of a sudden, think how you would feel if you weren't never worried about anything. Mm -hmm. If, if, if you didn't have any bitterness towards anybody or, or no one had bitterness towards you, all of a sudden, everything's okay. Yeah. And, and so I went through that life review. I couldn't tell you how many times, but what drove the, drove the process wasn't a consciousness beyond myself or beyond us driving the process. Mm -hmm. It was the need. As long as I kept on learning from this life review, I would, I would keep on going through it. And this went on for what seemed like forever. Mm. And uh, every time I started it, I knew that I would be better by the time I was done. And that was a very important lesson I learned because later on in life, that enabled me, even now to this day, if I find a fault in myself, I'm excited about it. Mm. You know, I, my, my, uh, my love of my life, uh, Kathy, she always says, says you're nuts <laughs> because, mm. because that as soon as I find something wrong with myself, I say, wow, it's a wonderful opportunity for improvement. Mm. And that's really the way I look at it now. All of a sudden, like that ego part of you that pushes back on things, it's not there anymore. I'm excited. I mean, I, I don't know how to explain it, but, but, I love learning and growing now. And that's what that life review taught me more than just the lessons that I learned, the peace that I found. Uh, it was that it made it okay to continue. Once I came back to earth is to be okay with learning and growing. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. And uh, then another thing that it taught me is your life experiences are everything. Some of my worst experiences in life were the things that I learned the most from. It really is. And so, so experiences are the only thing you could take with you. So live your life. You know, you know we're, we're not here to be spirits on the mountain and, and gurus meditating all day, although meditation is good and all those things, but you're here to enjoy life, to learn. When bad things happen, don't let bad things happen. But when they happen, 
accept it and find some peace in it, find some knowledge. We all have terrible things happen. And, uh, and, and that's another very important lesson I learned is the reason for life is to get as many experiences as you have, because those are the things of value. When you do your life review, those are the things that are going to drive your spiritual growth. Mm, yeah. Um, a couple questions here. Let's one thing for people that are new to near death experience. Let's kind of break down first life review. So when you experienced life review, where you felt like you were as a third person watching you and your life, or were you kind of re-experiencing it like as if a first person going through that again? Okay. And, and, um, I will let you, we'll, we'll start with that. Yeah, yeah, because when you get to the second question, I usually forget by the time we get there. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, um, both of those things. Mm-hmm. And let me explain. Is that is that I feel like I'm a voyeur in the scene, looking at the scene, mm-hmm. but I feel everything I was feeling at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, and and but but I don't have any influence on what's going on. Mm-hmm. Is it's playing by me? I feel all the emotions, but I also feel something else. I feel the, um, I also feel something else. I feel what other people are feeling in the circumstances. And so every scene that I had from my life is I was aware what everyone else was feeling and what I was feeling. And then all of a sudden, the situation was very different to me. I knew why Frankie was there and why Sally was there and why she did that. Everybody has a real reason why they do things, just as you have a real reason why you do things. Everybody has their own path to live. And that's one of the things I took away from those life experiences is that you have to let people don't have animosity towards people or, or because their station in life isn't what you think it should be. It's about, it's about everyone has their own paths. And so now all of a sudden, these arguments that I had, the fights in the schoolyard with this person, I thought they did this terrible thing to me. Well, they thought I was doing something terrible in their own world, in their own mind, or the girlfriend that dumped me or the girlfriend that I dumped, you know, you know, you, you see it from everybody's perspective. And that's how you get your spiritual growth. What you thought, all these scenes, all these things that happened, you thought one thing, but once you had a broader understanding of everything that was going on, all of a sudden, everything's okay because everyone had their reason to be there for those circumstances. You all had your lessons to learn. And each time I went through my life iteration and I reviewed those things, I saw more and more based upon the, my spiritual growth and my growth of awareness. Each time I grew even more. And so, uh, and so in short, is that, is that, yes, I was a voyeur, but I also had a deeper understanding of what was going on. I couldn't influence anything that happened or changed it, but, uh, but I was able to really make value of those experiences. Yeah. I mean, I think you had an amazing experience that something everybody would probably would wish that they could do. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, I believe in your book, you write about that you had three different places that you were kind of learning from and doing life experiences and, and or reviews. So in these three places, do you keep coming up with the same people over and over again? And the reason why I ask that is because I was doing these NDE podcasts, I talk to people and it's a kind of common thing that people believe that we travel in soul groups you know, you know, I don't know. I don't know if anybody has a number, but you know, in this lifetime, I may be your brother and the next time I'm your sister or your father or whatever. So I'm curious if you have ever thought about it within these three different places. Are you, do you, did you kept, you know, interacting with these same people over and over or not? Okay. So I want to talk to, to the soul group and I'll, I'll begin talking about that in just a few uh, moments, but no, they were different people different spirits in every place. Mm. And it wasn't until the very last place that I actually met two people in my life who had died. Prior to that point is that everybody 
I either didn't know or, or I knew in my life. And so the first per- place, as, you, as we've been discussing, was the work-like setting. And, uh, and I, I want to make, make an important point here is that these places that I went to, these three places where I learned lessons and experienced things, were taken from my life. If somebody lived in India, they would have different experiences. Or if somebody was a, uh, a, a you know, a, a carpenter or, or a priest or something else, they would have other experiences. But the lessons, I believe would be very similar, would be the same. The purpose is to reach the people in the way that they could be reached in order to teach them the lessons, in order to engage in this life review and engage in these other experiences to have. And so and so the reason why I say that is the next place was a neighborhood pub. Mm-hmm. And I know <laughs> I get a lot of stuff is, uh, online. People say, okay, Steve, let me get this straight. You were in a bar in heaven. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, and uh, it sounds like you went to cheers in heaven. <laughs> you, you got it, Jeff. No, no, that was, that was definitely it. But, but, but that was my, my, my life. It really was is, is because I was a biker. I was a partier. I did stuff, you know, mm-hmm. that, that was just my, my, my life. So, so now I was in this bar and I was being hired by the bar owner to run this place. Hmm. And, uh, and I was in charge of these kids and the kids are young adults who are the barmaids and barbacks. And, um, and, so, and so that was my experience there. But, but, but remember when, when I was talking before about how so many things in life, they have dual meanings. There's the first meaning, and then there's a deeper meaning why you do things. And so, and so in this place, um, I was to show the kids how to be barmaids and barbacks. Mm-hmm. But really, the real reason why I was there with those kids was to prepare them for human incarnation. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know this at the time. Wow. Is, is that I didn't think I was anywhere else. I just thought I was in a bar that I, w- I had, had this job and I was to take care of these kids. Mm-hmm. And uh, the kids wouldn't listen to me. Mm-hmm. No matter what I did. They wouldn't listen to me. I would have a connection like you and I have a connection right now. And then and then I'd be alone with the kids and they would scatter. And then I'd see them later and they would be like, you know, what's the problem? Like, like they didn't understand what was wrong here. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like reminded me of where I was with your cat or your dog. Like I'll be walking my, my, my dog and he'll see a deer and he'll run after it and he'll come back and he'll, he'll be all sorry or the cat will bring something dead home and give it to you as a present. Mm-hmm. And there's some times that I feel so close to the pets and animals around me but then, and I give them human-like qualities. But then in other ways, they do things that I know they're not human. Mm-hmm. And that's the way I felt with these kids. Mm-hmm. I felt there were some ways that I really connected with them and some ways that I didn't connect at all. And I would stand before this bar owner and there was something about him that uh, first off is we didn't talk, mm-hmm. is that there was an awareness. Now that my awareness is enlightened, is that I would stand before him with the things I was going through and I would feel things that he has gone through, similar things. I wouldn't be able to tell exactly what he experienced, but I would be able to tell what he learned from his experiences. And then I would try to get the kids to listen to me. And I just couldn't get the kids to listen to me. It was, it, it was very frustrating. It was a time that, that I really I wasn't sure what was going on. And then there's a very important part is that there was a lady there who was the, the owner's wife. And I felt such love from this lady. She was praying all the time. I didn't understand why she was there. Mm -hmm. And the kids were very upset by her presence. And I just didn't know what this was about. And at this point, it was, I was getting nowhere. And so finally, I I felt this to to, to the bar owner. The bar owner touched me. And all of a sudden, things changed. Everything changed. All of a sudden, as I started to see what's like an aura around people. The bar owner and the bar owner's wife, they had these beautiful auras. Mm -hmm. I had an aura because I could feel the energy and the glow and the kids had no auras at all. And then as I started to to feel the, um, the owner's presence, I began to realize 
that I was connecting with my higher self. Mm. Myself, the bar owner was my higher self. As mm. you say, like your spirit guide, that part of you, which is always in spirit, to, and that guides you through things in life. You may not know or be aware of it, but I was standing before my higher self, my spirit guide. And that's what was giving me this, this guidance to try to get me to be able to help the kids prepare for their human incarnation. And, uh, uh, but, but the kids were very upset about the owner's wife, very upset there. And, and I had, and finally I asked them, why is she there? And uh, the, my higher self said that she was invited and hmm. that was it. Hmm. I, and so it just never came up at all. And then, and then I began to, and then that was it. And then the next place I was, that all ended very abruptly. And the next place I was, was at a place where I live called the bluff. But I want to talk about that a little bit more is that, is that what I learned from the kids mm -hmm. is that, um, is that your spirit always was and always is, but it's not in its current form mm -hmm. is that your spirit grows over different incarnations. You may, you know, come into the spirit world as a plant or as a tree and then as a bird as a dog you know you, you know you go through and your spirit is evolved over time time and time again and uh, and you learn those lessons about being a spirit like one of the biggest lessons you know you as a spirit learn is to take care of kids you know how those types of compassions of love and other things and so you go through the spiritual evolution and really was i was there is i was being tested to to bring the kids into their first human incarnation mm. and that's where I failed because in my own mind after learning about all these things these spirit things I learned to see spirit in things I learned all these lessons that we talked about beforehand about uh, about uh, uh, the teacher inside of you that we're all connected and 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 experiences are everything and that there's a duality to existence that it's not just what you're doing there's hidden meanings i learned all those things when i had my first opportunity to to, to shepherd these kids into a human incarnation i failed i mm. failed miserably at it do you really feel that you were tested yeah i do you do feel that that was your test to bring them you know it's kind of a hard test i mean it's you know what how are you supposed to, you know, corral new spirits and bring them into you know, the, the first incarnation? I mean, that's that's got to well, be some serious spiritual ability. Well, to say the I'm least. with you, and, and I was being be, being tested, mm -hmm. but um, but I should have known. I learned all of these things. I was still very rooted in human existence. I wasn't in spirit world. Mm. That's what I was being tested. As I was being tested, what's going to be my next step in, in my spiritual evolution? Was I going to come back to earth as a person or if my body was still here back in my original state, or was I going to go on to the spirit world to be a spirit guide or go to the next evolutions, all things we could talk about later, but, but I failed and it's okay. Well, let me it's, stop it's let me yeah. stop you right there. So at this point, this is your second place. Mm -hmm. Do you understand at this point that you are not on earth? You're in a spiritual no. world. No, do, I do had think, no idea. Where, do you know, or do you think you're in a dream or you don't, you, are you, have you even just forgotten about your past life on earth? Like, where are you at this point? I just thought I was just working at it. You know, it sounds so strange because when I recount it to you now, the first things I think of, of course, you would know that, that you were in another place.
It sounds like to me you kept repeating day after day until you finally would ask them. No, no, because because as as I experience this, is that I think of new meanings for 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 things. It's a growth experience. Just as I I learn from my life review each time. Now each time I review that experience in that place, I learn more about things mm -hmm. in that same way. Because you're in a new spot each time you learn, and then mm -hmm. people like 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 yourself point out things that are perhaps so obvious to other people, but oblivious to me you know i think that's exactly what what happened mm -hmm. and so and so this went on and on and then finally i asked them in my own way through awareness and they said that they were there to make sure that i was all right yeah. and i didn't understand that at the time because i was fine i didn't i didn't i didn't think anything going on i just it just sent odd mm -hmm. and then so so we're watching the sunset and this time as the sun set, instead of dimming, it just got brighter and brighter and brighter. I couldn't see anymore. I had to shield my eyes. And then it just got so bright. When things calmed down, I opened my eyes. I was in a hospital bed. And my mother and my sister were, were hanging over me. And I had tubes all in me. I was tied down. Mm -hmm. I couldn't move. And that was returning back to Earth. Yeah, what an interesting way to, you know, an interesting experience right before you return, you know, makes a lot of sense to me. Well, well, it, it was very important because that there was something that I learned a little later on. I mean, I, I knew at the, the, the time, but I kept on running over in my mind. Why were Joey and Johnny there? Why did they die? And why were they there? Well, it just so happens that John, uh, Joey, he had a broken back. I had a broken back. He lived his life with a broken back and he like moved like, like, like this. And he had to recover from that. And then John, he had diabetes and he had like the bad circulation in his leg and it got all infected and that, that actually eventually killed him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, and I had a bad leg. My leg was all messed up and all wasn't infected, but it had all this reconstruction surgery and I almost lost my foot. And then what's more is uh, uh, Joey also got hit by a car and I was just hit by a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And what I learned there is they were going to be my spirit guides once I returned back to earth to help me through my recovery mm -hmm. and to be able to live with, with, my, with my pains and the things I go through every day. Because once I was able to begin to rehabilitate, I was like the Energizer Bunny. I woke up each day in pain. I was excited for the pain because I knew by the end of the day, I would be better. And it's not that Joey and Johnny were whispering in my ear, but I felt a certain energy around me that just kept me driving and keeping a positive attitude to get better. And so that's what I realized what they meant when they said they were there to make sure I was all right. It wasn't in the other place. Mm -hmm. They were there to make sure that I was all right here. I believe in your book that you mentioned that you're in the coma for about three weeks now that you look back on it, do you think that all your experiences that you went through, and I also believe that a uh, place beyond death, there is no time. Would you believe that you experienced whatever you can consider time much longer than three weeks? hundred percent. Mm. And what I mean is like, it's like, you ever, you ever like uh, have a day where you do so much in one day, you say, wow, that feels like this morning feels like yesterday. And why does that happen? Because there are so many events that happened. And so it wasn't that the sun rose and set there. I mean, it was when, when I was saying about that, but I mean that over everything. It wasn't that uh, people, it wasn't like that. Mm. But there was so much experiences, so much learning there that it, it was lifetimes. Mm -hmm. I learned up at least up until that point in my life, much more in that place that I learned prior to life. I had all of these wonderful and terrible experiences in life, but 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 they were just all my past. Now they fueled my growth. Mm -hmm. And so then I got to experience everything. How long does a life review take? Does it take a second or does it take a lifetime? I don't know. Right. But 
it was forever I was in that place. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. When I dream, at part of the dream, you don't, I don't know I'm in a dream, right? I mean, it's, and sometimes dreams are like so real for me and I'll wake up and, you know, it's, sometimes it's almost harder to distinguish reality from the dream. They are so real. And then sometimes during parts of the dream, I'll realize I'm dreaming and then I'll be like, why am I dreaming this? This is stupid. Let me think of something else. So A, do you dream? And if it's anything similar like that, is it different from what you experienced? Okay. For the longest time, I thought it was a dream. Mm. I really did. No, it was it was only with the help of my co-author, Kathy, mm. and certain things that happened that I began to realize that it wasn't a dream. And uh, and we're definitely going to touch on that. But uh, but one, one of the things about a dream is you're in a dream, it happens, and then you wake up. Mm-hmm. And and there, there's like one event in a dream, right? Or like two events in a dream, and then you wake up. This was over and over again for such a long period of time. Mm-hmm. It just it just went on and on and on, and so and so that was one of the reasons why one of the small reasons how it was different than a dream. A mm-hmm. dream is just happens, but this just went on forever and ever. And I experienced the same places and the same experiences. And each time I learned it, it picked up where it left off. It wasn't like, like sometimes you'll have the same dream, like, or similar dreams six months later, but this wasn't like that. It was this place that I was there for such a long time. And so there were similarities to a dream, but, but, but no, and there were things that once I came back to the real world that I realized it wasn't a dream, and we're going to touch on that in a short time. Hmm, very interesting. So now that you're back, what insights can you give us that you've learned from there that you've actually now implemented in your life today? Okay, I, I, I wanted to speak with, with that, but I'd like to tell you uh, uh, one more very important thing. Sure, go ahead. And so... Uh, and so I was, I was in my, I was in my uh, hospital room. I was all tied down. My mother had told me I'd been in an accident. And at first I didn't think, I thought this was just another scene that I had been through. Mm. And so I wasn't really sure. It took me a long time to begin to get the feel for it. And, uh, and then once I, I got out of the hospital, I went to, uh, I went to physical therapy. I started to walk. I couldn't walk at the time. Mm-hmm. I was in a wheelchair. It took me like a, almost a year just to get so I can walk. I did go back to work very early because I'm a computer guy and, uh, and I just, I, I needed to get out. I'm not, I'm a go getter. And so it's not like me to sit home, mm-hmm. but, uh, but it was, uh, I completely forgot about that other place. Hmm. In my own mind, I just said it was like the world according to Steve. Hmm. It really was. Okay. It was just the world according to Steve. And and I never heard anything like like this before. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm Catholic, a Christmas and Easter Catholic, you know, yeah. and you know, I just, you know, Christmas time, Jesus, and yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I am like 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 that, but but it wasn't like in my regular world. And then I was getting better and I was really, I felt Joey and John, I was starting to walk, I was starting to exercise and I started to do yoga, Kundalini yoga. I was really starting to feel really good. And then the worst thing that anyone could happen to their life happened to me is that one evening I went down in my basement and I found my 20 year old son dead in my basement from an overdose of oh, heroin. Wow, that's terrible. And he was the light of my life. I mean, I spent, oh, every, just my kids, at this time I worked from my home, my, my daughter and my son, I had become a member of the school board so I could help guide them. I was Mr. Mom, uh, my, my, my now ex-wife, she was a working girlfriend person. She wasn't, you know, and that's okay because if a guy was was a working guy, it would be okay. She was just very, she's a nurse. She was very committed to it. And I just, I'm a father, you know, it's what I'm into. Right. And, uh, and, you know, he was a great musician. 
I mean, he played Jimi Hendrix like Jimi Hendrix. He played Mozart like Mozart. He played Dizzy Gillespie. He played horns and guitars and pianos. He was a championship wrestler, New York State champion. He was on a full uh, of scholarship to one of the premier universities, Division I schools. And um, it, was, it was heartbreaking. And it wasn't something, it took me, it took me a, a long time to get out of this funk. I was just surrounded by it. And I was running through all these things about, about I should have did this, I should have done that. And how did I fail? And, and listen, I was, I was a guy, I liked to party and stuff, you know, and, and like, was, well, was I a bad influence? Like, like all these things ran through my head. And this is when a lifelong friend of mine, Kathy, um, began to, uh, we, I would, I would go hiking with her. Sometimes we would see each other. We had a whole group of friends and we'd go hiking and dog walking together. And so at this time I started to meet her. I was going through a divorce at the time and, uh, and we would start to talk about these things. And then I, all of a sudden I came to a realization is that I saw Kathy differently now. And then I started to see the spirit in Kathy. And I remember that spirit. That was the same spirit as a lady in the, in, in the place, the owner's wife. I realized that there was some sort of connection there, mm. but I kept it to myself. I didn't, I didn't share that because I thought it was a little too hokey about things. Mm. And it was at that time, Kathy said to me one time, she said, did Nick ever try to contact you? And I said, I, th I thought to myself, Kathy's out of her mind. Mm. You know, you know, I didn't believe any of this stuff. You know, you know, I just didn't. And she, and she said, well, think about it. So then I start to think about things and I start to think about that place and I start to think about my son and it wasn't like all of a sudden. It was like a little bite here, a little bite there. I start to think about, you know, was he in the place I was at? Was he experiencing those things that I was experiencing? Does, <clears throat> does he feel what I was feeling at that time? Because that was beautiful mm -hmm. and it felt really good to me. And it was that time I started to talk to Kathy about it a little bit more. And Kathy, Kathy was very receptive because we had, we had communicated. And, uh, and so, um, and so, uh, and so she, we went in the woods, we made it like a little shrine to my son and mm -hmm. we put, you know, rocks that people could write on. And every day we'd go back and there'd be more of these prayer stones there. Mm -hmm. They would take oh. off. I mean, we really enjoyed it. And people would write little prayer requests or, or I hope I do good on this test or, mm -hmm. or what would have is really exciting for us. And then, and then Kathy would say a prayer and I would go like this, you know, I, I wanted mm -hmm. to do the right thing. And, mm -hmm. but I was really starting to feel like I started to feel better. And then, uh, and then, uh, and then what, what, what happened was, is that, uh, is that we start to find flowers, roses all over the place. And Kathy was like kidding around with, with me. She was saying, Oh, Oh, Nick is sending the roses. So I was mm -hmm. like, come on, stop it. Just, just stop it. And she's saying, no, it's a sign. I feel it's a sign. Mm -hmm. It's like, Kathy, come on, come on. You're a little, you'll, <laughs> <laughs> but uh but but and she would get so mad at me when, when i would say that uh -huh. but but then what, what had happened is that my cousin went to a psychic mm -hmm. and uh and uh and the psychic said there's a nick here and that's my son's name who's trying to get through should i let him get through and so one thing led to another she said there were some numbers and uh, one and two, three and four, and five and six. And so she circled the one and two, and the um, and the and the two and the three and the five and the six. And she said to my cousin, "What do these things mean?" And she knew that uh, that that the two and the three and the five and the six was my son's Nick's and her son uh, Nick's cousins. Football numbers. They stood on the line together, big guys, and they would call them the Twin Towers and 56 for Lawrence Taylor and 23 for Michael Jordan. Those were their numbers. Mm. But she said, what's one and two? And so, uh, so it just so happens that was Nick's birthday. Mm. And, uh, and she said, well, St. Teresa is sending the flowers as a sign from Nick and that, uh, and that he wants, he wants his father to know he's okay. And, uh, and, and then so one thing led to another is that we found out that St. Teresa's birthday is the same birthday as my son's Nick's. Hmm. 
And, and so that, that was kind of strange. And, I, I, and Kathy was, was, was like, oh, yeah, yeah, St. Teresa's sending you the signs and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you're full of it. And then what, what, what happened is one day, uh, a friend of ours gave us a St. Teresa's prayer card on the anniversary of Nick's death. So we went down to our shrine. We sent in the woods. And Kathy's looking at the card. And she says, Steve, can you believe this? And she showed me the card. And on the card, the day uh, St. Teresa was canonized in Catholic religion, that's when you're declared a saint, mm -hmm. is the same day Nick died. Mm, that's wild. And, yeah. And, and so now I'm thinking like, they share the same birthday and, and the, and the day he dies, the day she was canonized and these flowers. And I started to think like, wow, you know, maybe there is something to this, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, you know, is that communication possible, but, but between spirit world and here, you know, isn't Nick's materializing flowers, which I didn't think so, or what people's paths crossing, same ways that my paths were crossing with the people in the place between here and there, that, uh, that, that, that someone left the flower because they had a wedding, because that they bought bouquet of flowers for somebody, but they were still there. It was the way that the universe communicates to you through signs. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so over a period of time, we had many of these signs and synchronicities that had happened over over it and just talking about it together is that I start to come to the realization that no, no, it wasn't a dream. It was real. Mm -hmm. And the lessons that I learned all about life, about the connected nature of things, that, that life is about experiences and that we're all connected and we're all part of the universe and that th there is a purpose of life. The purpose of life is to get as many experiences as you can, and as you grow, as you learn, you elevate and lift the consciousness of everybody that's around you. Mm. And uh, and so it's okay, it's okay to fail. It's okay to grow. It's okay to, to feel animosity and then to grow from it. You know, we learn that 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 the purpose of life is life itself, is that is that there is a monkey mind and there's a spirit mind. And in our incarnation here, you can't be all monkey minded. Monkeys don't care about anything. They they'll 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 eat anything, they'll kill anything, they'll 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 do all these terrible things and have no remorse about it. A spirit mind doesn't need to eat or anything. It's it's all spirit. And here on earth, we have to find our space in between there. Where do you want to be? You want to be closer to being a monkey? You want to be closer to being a spirit? Mm -hmm. And that's part of what our purpose here is to learn to, to, to find our place in the universe, to grow as a spirit, to help other people around us growing, mm -hmm. and to be all part of all that is. Have you ever spoke to Kathy about the significance of her praying in the bar? And is there uh, any significance with that? I'm glad you, you, you asked that. Could I, uh, could, could I ask Kathy to explain that? Okay, sure. Bring her on in. Kathy, are you here? Yes. Good. Come on, sit, sit down. This is the love of my life. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Kathy. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Great. How are you? Good. I've been mildly listening in the background because I've heard the story a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But so where are you at and what do you need? Uh, so, so, so he was asking about your praying in the, in the place between here and there okay. and uh, if it had some significance. Okay, well, I've always been into prayer, meditation, that kind of thing. I felt like since I was little, I had a connection to God, saints and angels. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that he, my nearest and dearest friend, was in an accident, I, I was crushed. I thought how... How can life go on without him? He was such a pillar in the community. If you read the book, you'll find that out. And um, he was like a larger than life guy. Mm -hmm. And he meant a lot to me and to everybody. So I needed him here. So when his cousin called me and said that he was in uh, a coma and they really didn't think he was going to make it, I, I was just agog at it. So mm -hmm. I did what I, I do. I prayed to my favorite saint, St. Jude. He's the patron saint of helpless and hopeless causes. And I just, in my head, um, because I had experienced loss, my mother and my brother suddenly passed. And I, I knew where they were. 
And I knew from reading books about life after death and that kind of thing, that when they're in that place, they could hear us. So I figured I'd talk to him. Mm -hmm. So I said, Steve, I can't be in the hospital. I'm not next to Ken, but I wanted to just you to pretend that I'm in there with you. I'm holding your hand and we're mm -hmm. saying the same Jude prayer. And I'm going to be here every day. I'm going to tell you this every day. So every day I said the prayer and I mean, it, it was a long time. Three weeks is a long time when someone you care about is mm -hmm. on the brink of life and death. So when um, I finally got a call from his cousin that he had come out of the coma, I was just so exhilarated. Mm -hmm. And she said, he wants to talk to you. So that night I got a text on my phone and it said, hi, Kath, it's Steve. I mm -hmm. want to thank you for visiting me when I was out, out, quote, unquote, if you know what I mean. I heard your prayers. I, um, I heard everything. And I know things. So I want to talk to you tomorrow. So that was just like, I knew that that was fact, that you can communicate with those in spirit or in the place between but just to have that physically happen in, in that way was such a validation because usually when people go to that place, they don't come back right? and they don't have that communication. Right. So when he said, I want to visit, I want, I thank you for visiting when I was out, out, that meant that he heard me. Mm. And so uh, when the story unfolded afterwards about he saying that I was there in that place because my higher self was there because uh -huh. we're always part here, part there, it just validated everything for me. And it just brought everything full circle because I believed in prayer. I believed in the eternity of life and love. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how, how, how does that not take this to another level. I think it's amazing. What was your relationship before the accident? Because you obviously knew each other. Were you guys friends? Or in he had said his marriage is all you he said his marriage was well, falling thing, apart. Well, yeah. Well we were we were just friends. We were mm -hmm. really good friends because mm -hmm. we had kids the same age. We were in the same town. We mm -hmm. they were growing up together basically. Mm -hmm. And um we were involved in the same community service group. He was like, he was the almost, a, he worked from home, but he was on the PTA. He was on uh, the board at the school. He was just always there. He was, a, they called him Captain Video because he videotaped everyone's games uh -huh. and put it on, I guess it was YouTube. Yeah, and that, and, was, and that was like 20 years of that. Yeah, that was when YouTube was like new. <laughs> yeah. Because, um, so we just all knew him and I became close with him as a result to, of these different communications together. Mm -hmm. And the thing about him, because I was married at the time, mm -hmm. was that he was always safe to me. He didn't hit on me. He was very respectful. Mm -hmm. So it, it offered me the ability to get close to him. He never mm -hmm. crossed any lines. Mm -hmm. So we were friends for so many years. Mm -hmm. So when, um, then later on, I was going through a divorce mm -hmm. and then he was, but we were still friends mm -hmm. because, you know, when you're friends for so long, you don't want to cross that line because if friend anything happens, you know, <laughs> you, you ruin the relationship altogether. Right. So and, was, and she also tipped me off to things that girls did. And, you know, you know, it, it definitely, you know, having a friend like, like, like that. And yeah. she had a girl scout troop and I was involved in local politics and, mm -hmm. and local history. And so she was always bringing her troop over for a badge or stuff. I would take them through all these hikes and <laughs> stuff. So, so we definitely began good friends because mm -hmm. to many people in the community, I was Mr. Mom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so all my friends were mothers. Oh, and right. so, uh, and, and so, but, but, but Kathy and our relationship, it was very firmly rooted in that. And, uh, and through he was, hiking. He was a scary biker dude, but he she also, was Molly Ringwald. He was like <laughs> very soft and that he was involved in all the mom things. So he was just like hanging out with another girl, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. He had a ponytail too, so I was think I'm getting like, one back again. <laughs> getting, see, you get, see, yeah, see, yeah, there you Very go. Awesome. We're probably all about the same age, so yeah. I mean, you're speaking Molly Ringwald and yeah. <laughs> iconic. Well, but it's, it's definitely we were we were friends for a very long time, and mm -hmm. and and so that's why you know when I realized actually when I was in my hospital bed 
one of the first thoughts I came to was that that lady had the same spirit as my friend Kathy. And that's what caused me to text her. But after this exchange, like I forgot about it for a while. It took like about a year it after took that. It took a long time. So, you know, it was very frustrating because- I was I was just frustrated with him because I I always had that spiritual background. And like mm-hmm. like he said, he was a zero. Yeah. A zero. On, on, the, <laughs> on the spirituality meter. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, so even though he- came back and validated that he heard me on the other side mm. and all these things were happening with the roses that I knew intuitively were a sign from his son. Mm. He still was just, he wasn't getting it. I'm yeah. like, how do you not get it? I mean, all this stuff is happening. Yeah. And it, it, it took so much to get into that head of his. Once he validated that now in the book, there's like a whole other series of events that happen mm. after Nick's passing, the signs, synchronicities, because once that spiritual door opens, it like busts open and the light comes in. Mm -hmm. So then all of a sudden he started being almost too spiritual and being like, oh, see, Kat, like, you know, like (laughs) thinking he was more spiritual than me, Uh which. uh, (laughs) Now you had a spiritual competition. Well, yeah, that's well, what it is. I think, I, I think one of one of the biggest changes, even, even for both of us, is that once this happened, and I began to have an open mind towards this. Once we found the birth dates and the canonization dates, mm-hmm. and we had been through all these things, like all of a sudden, I had an open mind towards it. And so, and so, one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to do yoga because that I remember seeing people who were into yoga. They had that spirit look about them mm-hmm. and I didn't know too much about it. Mm-hmm. And so we were, I was attracted to this form of spiritual yoga called Kundalini yoga. And I'd asked Kathy to go with, with me and she told me no. And then I, because we were doing too many things at the time, we, we, we were just starting, we weren't more than friends, but we were spending a lot of time with, with each other at that time. And so, uh, and so I told her I would go without her and I'd let her know how it went. And she said to me, uh, uh-uh, Steve, you and 20 girls doing downward dog and I'm going. And so, uh, and so, uh, and so that's, that's when we started to do the Kundalini yoga. And it was through that practice and connecting with the meditation and being around other people who are open to spirit. It wasn't just Kathy, you know, you know, Kathy was, was like, see, 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 mm-hmm. you know, you know, there was, so it was a process. It took me a long time to begin to really start to put the pieces together. And it wasn't until we came into contact with this beautiful 85 year old yogi that uh, that that we wanted to raise money to uh, send her to a yoga festival that we did our first workshop on the place between here and there is a spot when I plug our book <laughs> and uh, and uh, and we did this workshop and we raised money to send her. We raised like $2,000. And so what happened is I, we did this workshop where, where I told our story and Kathy jumped in and told the story and we raised $2,000. And mm-hmm. then we, we, we began to go on this, this tour where, where we start to give these workshops to people and we're giving the money to different charities and such. And we started to realize that people were interested in this story. And Kathy always told me is, is <laughs> that, is, is that you have to share I told it. Them to say it. And, I, and I thought of, I was, I didn't think I wanted to share it because that I was very much involved in politics and it was all about Steve and the Steve world. And, and I just, I was away from that now as I, I liked my anonymity and I wanted to, you know, I just didn't want to do that. There were a whole lot of reasons. And I could just picture my friends saying, all right, Steve, what are you doing now? You know, it's, it's, it's like that kind of stuff. And it just took me a long time to really realize that people would be interested in, mm-hmm. in, in what had happened. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it was through doing this, th- these workshops for this beautiful lady and for some friends of ours, our friend Shawnee, who's in the book as well. Um, you know, we raised this money. And, uh, and then finally, we decided to write the book and uh, share our it's experiences. It's kind of a little different than that because the yes, whole <laughs> time that um, after Nick's passing and his, how everything unfolded so synchronistically, so like magically, I said that there's a reason why that you, that you were there. Like, obviously, you were there to help you prepare for Nick's passing, like mm. to have that experience helped him understand Nick's passing. And the fact that he was a seasoned speaker, he he would host 
community events, sports events at school, um, on the board of directors. So he has this ability to communicate in a way that is very effective to reach people. So all this like seemed to me obvious that he needed to tell the story because not only had he been to a place where he learned about all this wonderful stuff that could help people in grief situations and also in spiritually opening themselves up, but then to have him lose his son and be able to get over that because of those experiences. I mean, that's a triple, like you got to tell the story because you could help all kinds of people. Yeah. And he's just so who would want to listen to me? I'm like, I'm telling you, and this was a battle for like years. Yeah. So finally, when that that woman that we love at yoga, um, she wanted to go to that yoga festival and she couldn't afford it. And then he said, "Oh, I have an idea. How about I tell the story and then we'll just raise money for her?" I was like, "Finally, mm-hmm. yes!" And then the feedback that he got after speaking, like then he saw like it helps people. Yeah. And, and that's and that's really, really where most of our uh, connections are. Some are from near death experiences. A, a lot of them are. But mm-hmm. but but really, most of it is from people who've lost loved yeah. ones yeah. and are suffering from it. And just the understanding that there is some place else that perhaps communication is possible, mm-hmm. but but really that they're OK. And there's meaning and there's purpose to life. And it isn't that all of a sudden you, you're just dead and, and that's it. Your consciousness is gone. There is a continuation of consciousness and you will meet again and you'll meet in your full self, not just your human self, but in your soul, full self. And you had mentioned about soul families. Kathy and I, I'm certain we are part of a soul family ourselves. And that's why we have this connection. That's why we had this friendship. That's why we shared this experience because it was a shared experience, the whole shared experience. Part of our book is about the place between here and there, but also a big part of the book is about myself and and making that journey from being a person of science that is two plus two equals four, and that's the only truth in life, to to really understanding that there is something more. And even if you're a scientific person, everything had to start somewhere. You know, there is a big unknown out there, Mm -hmm. and it's not going to be found in an equation. An equation can explain part of it, but not all of it. And so, and, and so that's, that, that's really when, when we talk to people, we get letters from people all the time. We even meet people and we just share it and just, just talking to them. That has been the most thrill of it all, you, you know, is applying it because you asked, what does it mean in this world? Like, what are the lessons? That has to be the most important thing because that's the things that people suffer the most from. Losing a child, there is nothing worse than that. Or, or losing a loved one, a spouse or a parent who took care of you when you were a kid. But, but for that to make sense, I recently lost my dad and uh, just a few weeks ago and he had terrible cancer and, uh, and I went down to Florida to see him and I got to spend the last few days of his life with him and, uh, and it was okay. I was glad I can be there. I wasn't like many people if they were in that situation that they might be a wreck and, and rightly so. But I felt privileged to be there. And we would talk about spirituality things. And he wasn't a spiritual person at all. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I felt like being there to shepherd him through this point, and that would be okay. You know, he felt my energy. He would say, Steve, you're real cool, cool about this, you know? I said, no, Dad, it's okay. It's going to be okay. He said, he was very sick at the time. And he was like, he didn't even care if it wasn't, wasn't going to be okay. Mm-hmm. He wanted to, you know, he had enough. But but it was through that process that I helped him prepare for his passing mm-hmm. in a way that that it was the most mean it was one of the most meaningful times of my life to be there at that time. And for people to realize is yes, it's okay. People are born, people die. There's purpose and there's meaning to life. It's not that they don't grieve or I don't grieve for my father or my son, which I grieve terribly, but I know. There's love and peace and there's purpose to life. And uh, that's what that experience taught mm. both of us. But Kathy already knew it. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Well, besides the book, do you guys have any other projects that you're working on right now that you want other people to know about? 
Well, um, Kathy and I, we <laughs> live in this beautiful house uh-huh. in, uh, in uh, Fort Salonga in, uh, on Long Island. And it, we live in this really nice neighborhood, but our house is a little shack. And we love it, mm-hmm. and uh, and we and we collect crystals, and we do uh, we do all types of Reiki healing, and we have these sound concerts. Kathy plays the gong, and I play the uh, uh, Indian flute, and we have people over here, and we play music, and we never charge anything for it. It's all just instead of hanging out at a bar with with, with your friends and partying, mm-hmm. we 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 do these things. We do the Reiki, we do the sound healing, we we just have a lot of fun. We're really rooting in friendship and we I learned my lesson we're mentoring kids mm-hmm. and so many times we, we we meet these young adults at these at these uh events like like we'll go to the beach and there'll be somebody playing a gong or having a concert we'll meet the kids there and we'll invite them over and we'll have them at the house and, and we'll show them that there's another side that like you could have fun we have these curtains which which are singing you all get together and you sing sing like a uh, high Krishna and, and those very cliche songs, but you have a great time because everybody plays an instrument. You'll teach them how to play a drum. And so it's all about just having fun, having a good time. You know, you know, most of the people drink tea afterwards, me and Kathy, you know, a little bit of wine too. Mm-hmm. And we just, we just have a good time. And so, and so, yes, it's, it's about mentoring the kids. It's about having good friends, good relationships, having experiences, exploring the Reiki and the sound healing and our music and just everything. We're just living life to its fullest. We have two dogs that, that just bark all day, but they're being very good today. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we're just living life, life to our fullest. And we really hope that, uh, that with the book that we could continue to reach out to people and just, mm-hmm. and just spread the word. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, especially in these times with, with these terrible things that are going on in the world, mm-hmm. that, uh, that, that even for those things, there's a purpose. Mm-hmm. And we're going to come out on the other side of this as a people, as spirits, even better than when we started. And I know it's very difficult for people to understand now, but we're evolving as people and as a spirit and as humanity. Right, Kathy? Right. No, no, you, you have something no, yeah, to say I, about that. Oh, I was thinking of something <laughs> okay, else, actually. Okay. I, I didn't, did you touch on religion at all? No, I'm not sure I know. Okay. I just, I just want to make something clear is that like when we talk about the saints and angels and all that stuff in the book, the truth is it's not like we're just saying that this is a Christian based book. The, all, all religions are the same thing in different forms, all paths leading to one destination. Mm-hmm. So his, his and our experience was rooted in the deities that mean something to us. Mm -hmm. But we're not saying that those are the only gods. I mean, the ascended masters, Jesus, Buddha, Kuan Yin, Mm -hmm. Krishna, like they're all, they're all one. We're all one. It's not one religion. There's one God per se, the universal consciousness, but all of these people were in, in life for, to bring forth the message to humanity. Mm -hmm. So we, we, Praise all of them. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to make that clear that this is not a book that's only geared towards Christians. I chose to to say the Saint Jude prayer, mm-hmm. but I, I'll also pray to Kuan Yin, to Buddha, to yeah. um, to different Saraswati Hindu gods and goddesses. So I just I just wanted to make that clear because I don't want people to be turned off thinking that this is just. Like he only went to that place because he's Catholic. That's not how it is. Because it was just rooted in my experiences. Yeah. But uh, yeah. but and we spend a lot of time with uh, you know you walk around our house. We have in our outside of the house we have we have Buddha, we have Krishna, we have Saint Mary, we have you know we, we have all these statues that are lit up and uh, and it really is is that is that there is a common link that links all people and all spirituality. And, uh, and they really are, it all gets back to the same thing. And then this isn't something that Stephen and Kathy invented. You know, people have had this for, for a long time. Everybody knows intuitively that, that there's one creator and we're all part of that creation. And that's all about love. And it's about learning how to love and to be loved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
And really, that's and, why we're here. Yeah. And and what what I was saying to Kathy before, what about the universal consciousness about making it on the other side of this COVID and all the craziness that's mm-hmm. going on is that it's going to be better because the universal consciousness of everything will be raised, and you'll see, and that people will value each other more. We'll, we'll grow as, as a society. We'll be more humanistic and more understanding. Yeah. And this turmoil, I don't think it had to happen this way, but it's happening this way. Mm-hmm. We're going to be better. There's light at the other end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. And that's what, what we want people to see is that mm-hmm. through spirituality, through love and understanding, you can have a great time, mm-hmm. but also everything's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And Kathy and I, we, we, have, we have a lot of fun. I mean, we are not like... I mean, we're spiritual people, but but we're not holy. You know, we like to do crazy things. I mean, it, was, it definitely is, and that's and that's what what we're saying is that you don't have to be the guru on the mountain to get in touch with your spirituality. We don't have to be the monkey either. Mm-hmm. You could live life. The purpose to life is to live it. Yeah. Don't yeah. imagine it. Don't have your head always in the spirit world. You have to you have to enjoy the things that are here in life. That's what you're here for. You're here to get these experiences. Mm-hmm. And to really, and if there's one other thing as I could say is that, wow, shame and regret's a terrible thing. And just just try to learn that these experiences make you a better person. And, and really enlighten you. And if you get over the trauma of the experience, you learn the lesson, you'll find that bliss in this world or any other world that comes afterwards. Mm. So um, let's go with this. Where can we find the book at? Is it on Amazon? Is, uh, what places can people get your book? Yeah, it's, it's available on Amazon. It's the place between here and there. Mm-hmm. We have, <laughs> this is Kathy's part. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a, uh, we have a soft cover book. We have an audio book. So, so if you like audio, mm-hmm. audio, uh, audible, it's on audio book and a great, great production. And we also have it on Kindle. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we're also having it translated into Spanish right now. Mm-hmm. And so we expect to have that out in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and after that, uh, we're selling it all over the world. It's, you know, we're doing, you know, it's getting out there and we've been, uh, you know, it, we're very surprised at how well it's doing. And Kathy's not surprised, but I am. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and throughout the whole book, um, uh, you know, Kathy and I, it took us about a half a year to write it. And, uh, and, you know, I could be a little Pig-headed. <laughs> <laughs> and she and she does poke a lot of fun at me during the the, the book, and it really is. It's a wonderful narrative, and uh, and Kathy's responsible for most of the narrative because it's definitely a certain wit, and you know, just between the two of us, um, you know, it's 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 a great read and uh and the questions and answers are very much important in the, in the back of the book because mm-hmm. that when we designed the book as we made it we wanted to not we want to keep the story but there are a lot of things that the story relates to and we and we address those in the questions and answers that gives extra insight into what's going on and we separated those two because we wanted a flow of the narrative of what's happened so people can really get be there themselves and feel what we felt. If people want to contact you, what's the best way? Do you have a website, a Facebook yes. page, yes. Or, or both, or or more? All the above. All so, so, above. so, so one of the big, if you go on Facebook and you just uh, you know the place between here and there, we have a website that has all the uh, all the happenings on it. But, but if you want to get in contact with with us, it's info i n f o at between here and there dot org info at between here and there dot org we answer everybody back and then especially if you had a question about the book you know definitely send us a question but or if, if you're suffering from a loss or you're having trouble you know we don't mind yeah i mean we won't be able to i mean we're not we're not you know we're therapists, not but we're not psychiatrists but 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 it's okay. We'll, we'll talk to you about almost anything, at least right now in our lives, is that, is, is that we have this opportunity. And, uh, and so if, if you're having trouble, send us a note. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll certainly talk to you about it. And in fact, we, we do meet people um, 
all the time from who's contacted us from the book, you know, people who are struggling with the loss of a child, especially, or people who are going through depression about broken relationships and stuff. And, uh, and it's not that, that, that we're gurus or anything on that, just by sharing our experiences of love and life and that there is a purpose to things. It does help to bring peace to people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're on YouTube. And we're on YouTube. <laughs> you know, you guys are great on camera and very personable. Have you considered doing live streaming on your Facebook where people can actually chat with you in real time? They'll submit yes. questions and you answer them. And maybe you're already doing mm-hmm. it. I don't know. No, that 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 is something we definitely want to do. Uh, we, uh, we were on a... Uh, uh, a show a few weeks ago and they actually reached out to us and asked us if we want to do a regular weekly show on that uh, using Zoom, very similar to what we are doing here. Mm-hmm. And so we're in the preliminary stages of that and we do like the interaction mm-hmm. because really that's what gives us purpose to, to, to this. I'm a computer guy. I'm not a wealthy guy, but, but uh, you know, I, it's not about the money. Mm-hmm. It's about reaching out to people and sharing things. This is so important to us. Why did, why did I survive? Why did Kathy and I, our lives are so different now than what they were. And once we began to apply the lessons that we learned in this place together, our lives started turning around. It wasn't that it was terrible before, but now our life is so blissful just by applying the things that, that, that you learn, all of a sudden changing your state of mind, mm-hmm. like, like, like not having hatred or animosity or guilt, all of a sudden it changes your, your outlook towards life. And, uh, and we call it the law of attraction is that, mm-hmm. is that if you're thinking positive, you're feeling positive, positive things happen in your life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of babbled too long. I okay. lost my thought. Let me get a, um, <laughs> I have- I was going to say, I have a nice comment or comments that I have here. You are such a beautiful couple. I can't wait to, I can't wait to read the book and thanks for your positive message. Thank you. And, um, well, before we wrap it up here, can you give us what you think is the most important message that we need to hear? I would say that life is good and people are good, even when very sad things happen. And if you keep that in your mind and you make it yourself, you understand it for yourself, not because of Stevie and Kathy's words, but the, your inner teacher, Om Namo Gurudev Namo, that means you bow to the inner teacher with inside yourself. If you truly understand that through all the things that we talked about today, life is good and people are good even when very sad things happen. That sums up everything that, that we've discussed today. That, that if you think about that, you meditate on it, you make it your own, your life will be different. You'll be happy. You won't need all these other things. You might, might do things because they're fun, but you won't need them as therapy. You, you, you really will feel the love and the light in everything. And you know what? There is a quote, but in the beginning of each chapter, we put a quote, like a Rumi quote or Jesus quote or something. Mm -hmm. And there's a quote by uh, a yogi that we know. His name is Jai Dev Singh. Mm -hmm. And he says that once you eliminate the root fear in life, which is the fear of death, and and I'm I'm, I'm just paraphrasing Mm -hmm. it, Mm -hmm. then all other fears disappear Mm -hmm. because it's okay. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. You know, there is more. And it's beautiful. So there is beautiful, but here is beautiful too. Yeah. Yeah. There is beautiful, but here is beautiful too. Oh, that's great. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me. You guys are really fun guests. I wish you you massive success with your book. Thank you. Everything else you do in life. I let them hang out a little bit. You got to do that, you know? You got to, there's a little bit of a dramatic (laughs) pause. But yeah, I do wish you the best and um, I really appreciate it. And same Thank to you. So much. And, and best of all, you know, about you reaching out to people yourself through your podcast, through your mm-hmm. children's podcast as well. And, uh, and you're a dad too. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so we, we wish you love and light and continue on your mission, spread the word and uh, mm-hmm. best of success to you. Thank you very soon. much. Right. And, and one last question. Comment, wow, amazing couple. I guess uh, that kiss really was. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys and have a great evening. Bye. Peace. Bye. Bye.